Thanks everyone for joining. Today we're kind of recapping. We had a meeting last week in person uh, with Tycor Title regarding creative financing, specifically uh, different forms of seller financing. Um, I have done a few of these options, but I'm far from an expert. So I'm going to do my best to kind of recap. But specifically, they they taught they went way deep in on um, all the different ways. Uh, creative ways to to get a deal done beyond like standard financing um, but really what i want to focus on today is um how can we take this information and use it when we're talking to buyers or sellers who are potentially interviewing other people or even if they're not interviewing other people and like really provide more options to them um so that's kind of what i want to what the the goal of this conversation beyond just educating people on, on these different options, how can we use this to win over buyers and sellers? So um, um, I got my notes up here. <clears throat> okay, so there are four uh, four types of seller, finance, seller financing that we discussed. Uh, pluses and minuses to both, and um, obviously some will just not be feasible, but we're going to kind of go through each one. So there are notes and deeds of trust. This is just simply where a seller um, owns a property and they are going to be both the lender and the seller at the same time, okay? So the seller, uh, I'm selling a property for $500,000 that I own free and clear. And the buyer, um, for one reason or another, can't get financing. So that's some of the reasons why they might not be able to get financing. Maybe the home's in really poor condition. So it's not financeable without like a hard money lender. Um, or maybe um, a situation that I was just in, I helped a, I helped a client buy a home with owner financing um, because he had just completely changed industries and he needed two years of tax returns in, able to, in order to get financing. Um, so he said, well, Isaac, if you can find me a home that can be owner finance, like I'm not picky. And we found one um, because we found a seller who was like, yeah, man, if you give me my list price, the list price was high, it wasn't worth that, um, I'll own or finance it. So anyways, essentially how it works is we wrote an offer. I'm actually just going to use his as an example. It was a $420,000 home. And so we wrote a standard offer, right? But instead of a Form 22A, we used a Form 22C. Um, a 22C is a really complicated form. You can do it. You're, you're licensed to do it. I mean, I, there's some things as a, we're not attorneys that we're not licensed to do. This is a form that you can fill out. It is complicated though. So if you're filling a 22C out for the first time, please contact Kim. Um, um, and if Kim is okay, and if Kim wants, she can say contact Isaac because I've done quite a few of them. Um, but contact Kim and get some help on it, at least the first time, because it is a little complicated. But 22C has an option um, similar to 22A where it's saying, okay, the owner is going to finance a home. And it has everything like, okay, what's the down payment going to be? What's the interest rate going to be? Is are the payments going to be principal and interest or interest only payments? When's the balloon? So I'm throwing a lot of terms, but um, if you, I'm not going to spend too much time diving into all the terms. But if you have questions, speak up. And then also, if you want to take a deeper dive, just schedule a, a phone call with me or Ken to talk about it. But um, essentially, it's a whole separate thing that you're negotiating on, right? So we wrote a full price offer at 419. Um, which again, we felt was like 30,000 high. We felt like the comps were coming in at like 390, 380. And so we said, here's a full price offer, but we want really attractive owner financing terms. So we literally got a four and a half percent interest rate, um, interest only payments. So, I mean, you can do the math. Uh, we did 10% uh, down payment. So, well, let's, let's do the math. So uh, 419, times 0 0.9, that's 90%, that's 377, 100 times 0 0.044, that's, oops, no, I did that wrong. 19 times 0 0.9 times 0 0.045, 4.5% divided by 12. So his payment every month is 1,414 for a $400,000 home. And all he needed was 10% down. So it was like a little over 40 grand. And he is turning it into an Airbnb. It's in Lake Bay. And he's already booking like 70% occupancy at 180 bucks a night. So again, you can do the math. It's a pretty sick option. Um, 
And the seller was happy too, because the seller didn't need the money. He was an investor. He owned the property free and clear. And so he was like, sure, if you give me 30,000 more than, you know, then he probably was starting to get realistic that it's not worth that. Then yeah, I will also be the, fi the finance here. So but those are the positives, right? You can see how you can go to a seller who owns a property free and clear and tell them why this is a potentially good option. In general, you can make more money for the home if you offer owner financing. The buyer makes a lot of sense too, right? My buyer got really good terms. He just had to pay a little extra. So that's a, you know, for, for a buyer in his case, he literally could not get standard financing. So this was the only way you could buy a home. So anyways, you can see the positives. Let's talk about some of the negatives. Um, some of the negatives for a seller is the obvious one. You're not going to get all that money up front, right? You're essentially, it's like, you've got the money and then you loaned it to somebody. And now you're just going to make $1,400 a month for the next five years. Cause we had a five-year balloon and a balloon is when um, the note is due when he has to refinance it or sell the property sometime in the next five years. Um, so that's, that's a negative, but to this seller, he was fine with that. He was like, cool, I'm just gonna make $1,400 a month for the next five years. And after five years, I'm gonna get all the rest of the money, right? He got 10% and now he's gonna get the other 90% in five years. That's, that's a win, but not if you need the money right away. So that's a negative. Another negative is if your seller doesn't have a ton of equity or have the home paid off, it's not really feasible because the seller needs to pay off the loan, right? So if the seller owes, if the seller owed 100,000 on this home, he would need the down payment to be 100,000 plus all his closing costs. So his closing costs were about 8%. So the seller really walked away with only 2% because he had to pay the commissions, my commission, his, his broker's commission, excise tax, title and escrow fees, all that, right? Get the septic pump, all those things had to be paid. Um, so the seller didn't get a lot of money. 10% is normally pretty low, but it, it, we only need 10% because he didn't owe any money on the property. So obviously if you have a client who owes a lot of money on a property, it's probably not feasible because the buyer probably doesn't have a hundred thousand plus to put down. My buyer had enough to put 10% down, but not a hundred thousand plus 10%. Does that make sense? So it's a really cool option. I think it makes sense for the buyer and the seller. And it's definitely something you should talk to your buyer and your seller about. Um, and again, we're gonna get into that a little bit later but know who you're talking to, right? If you're talking to um, somebody who bought their home three years ago for 300,000, now it's worth 400,000 and they owe 280, 270. It's like, that's not, don't, I wouldn't even talk to them about it. Cause it's like, it, <laughs> it just doesn't make sense. It would be like talking to a zero down BA buyer about um, writing a cash offer. It's like, well, I can't. So Anyways, know who you're talking to. This is not something that you bring up to every seller. Um, but it is something I bring up to most buyers. If you have 10% or more down, which is not, sorry, I shouldn't say most buyers. If a buyer has 10% or more down, I say that's really all you need because the seller is going to want at least 10% so they can pay all their closing costs. Um, but you can possibly negotiate better terms. And so with this client, again, he was betting that in five years, the market's going to be better and he can refinance and interest rates are going to be better and so on. And he just wanted a low payment so he can get some cash flow because he had some money that he got from an inheritance that he didn't want to put in the stock market. He wanted to buy real estate and all the other benefits of being a, a real estate investor. You know, he can write off. So that $17,000 he pays a year in interest only payments. That's all a write off. This is something that I swear most real estate agents don't talk about. It's like such a great video idea. This is my problem. I go all around talking about different things. But guys, seriously, I did a video about this. I really suggest you guys go to my Instagram and watch the video I did and copy it and do, do the exact same video and post on your Instagram. Most people don't know that you write off all, you can write off all the interest that you pay on your mortgage. So he's paying $17,000 a month in interest. Let's say he makes $100,000 a year. That's going to put him in a lower tax bracket. Be careful when you're saying these things because obviously we're not CPAs. Say like, you know, talk to your CPA. But if you make $83,000 a year versus $100,000 a year, you're going to like, I don't know what the exact tax brackets are, but you're likely going to pay less in taxes. So it's literally saving you thousands of dollars in taxes by having a mortgage. Um, and also... He's making the cash flow, right? There's so there's so many benefits. Anyways, so 
that was one of them. That's a, that's just standard owner, owner, owner financing, um, a note and deed of trust. Second, um, not second, like in order. These are just, next one I'm going to talk about um, is real estate contracts. Okay, this is one that I haven't done and it scares me and confuses me a little bit. So I'm going to do my best. Um, and then if I don't have all the answers, I've got resources. We have the information. Rachel, maybe in the recap, you can send out the information one more time for the um, contacts at Tycor because they offered that they would be happy to um, to um, advise you through through any of these if you're like trying to explain to a client. Okay, so real estate contract, similar to owner financing, except the buyer doesn't actually buy the home. They sign a lease with an option to buy the home. Okay, so this is for a seller who is who wants to sell a property, but they don't own the property free and clear, right? They still have a mortgage on it. And so they're going to say, okay, buyer's going to pay me $2,000 a month for this home for the next year or two years, whatever, that's all negotiable. And then after that point, they're going to buy it for $400,000. Now, if the market goes up, the buyer still gets to buy it for $400,000. So that's a benefit for the buyer. If the market goes down, the, the buyer can back out, but they'll likely lose a deposit that goes to the to the um, seller at the beginning of during this negotiation, like ten thousand dollars or so. So then the seller would get all the rent that they made and also the deposit. But all those things are negotiable, right? You can negotiate that there's no deposit. You can negotiate that the rent payments get credited to the purchase price. You can negotiate all these things. But the reason you would do this as opposed to the first one I mentioned is um, if you were to sell the property, but there's still a loan on the property that the buyer can't come in with that you know, $200,000 payoff for the loan, then um, the loan would be called due. When title changes hands, when, when you sell a property, you can't sell it without the lender saying, yes, we're good. And they're not going to say, yes, we're good unless they're paid off. So this is a way to sell it without selling it because you're essentially selling it in the future, right? It's almost, it's almost, this is not, this is just analogy that popped in my head. It's almost like you write a contract with a two year, like closing in two years and early occupancy for, for 24 months. And we're going to pay you $2,000 a month. It's honestly kind of similar to that. Um, this option is a little scary. I've talked to attorneys who say, um, who say it's, it's risky for the seller, not as much for the buyer. But this is something, and Kim, you, I would actually, I'm going to call on you, Kim, to talk about your experience, because Kim actually negotiated a deal like this, where she represented the seller last year. So Kim, I'm going to ask you to talk about it. But this is something I would highly, highly advise you, if, if, if you give the information that I just gave your clients, and they're still interested, whether you represent the buyer or seller, definitely seek legal counsel. It's too complicated, and you don't want the buyer to agree to this and then have some loophole in the in the contract where the seller can get out after two years because the market's gone way up and now they're screwed and they have to move out of the house right there's th this is too serious of an issue whereas the first one it's all written out in the contract and title literally changes hands and so it's much safer this one you definitely want to speak with an attorney so kim can you kind of talk about your experience uh doing that when you sold your your husband's home yeah, so um, it's still under a lease option to purchase. I didn't actually do paperwork for them on this. When he decided to go into a lease option with this gentleman, I said they needed to get an attorney to draw it up. Um, I didn't feel comfortable handling that. So they had an attorney draw up essentially kind of this whole uh, contract that that we have, but I felt given the situation, it was better to not be involved with it as an agent. And they used a real estate attorney. Um, was, and it is a big risk and we'll see what happens come June. Um, <clears throat> whether or not the buyer can, can go through with it and purchase. If he cannot, it reverts back to my husband and he loses the, he put 50,000 down. Um, and if he's not able to purchase it, unless he and my husband come to another agreement, 
he forfeits uh, all the money that he's paid. So we'll see what happens. But I, I can't really speak to all the terms of it because I did not want to be a party to it. And guys, that's your designated broker who told her husband to talk to an attorney. Like just, just to point out, this is not just, <laughs> yeah. you know, I say all the time, like, hey, you should tell, tell your client, talk to an attorney. And sometimes I'm saying it, even though like we, we can probably do it. This is not one of those situations. This is literally your designated broker said to her husband, you need to talk to an attorney. Like this is too serious of an issue. But I'm going to say this throughout this meeting. The goal of this meeting is to have these different tools in your tool belt as options that you can give your buyers and your sellers. Um, you don't have to have all the information, right? Like I don't have to be a tax expert to say uh, you can write off the interest. But if I tell a client that and somebody else they're interviewing doesn't tell them that, even though I'm not going to be able to tell you exactly how much it's going to reduce your tax liability and so on, I look good because I gave them an option that somebody else didn't, didn't give them. So I'm not saying this is all supposed to be self-serving, but I mean, it is, right? Like we're like, this helps you get a client, even if they don't use any of the things we talk about there, you are much more likely to be hired as someone's buyer's agent or listing agent. If you're saying, here are all the different ways we can sell your home or all the different ways you can buy a home. And the other person they're interview, interviewing is like, yeah, we're just going to list the home and it's going to be conventional FHA or VA. And that's the only buyers we got and blah, blah. If you provide these as options, and you, even if you don't have all the information, you are way more attractive. You just seem way more knowledgeable about this. So that's really, I'm going to say that again and again throughout this meeting, but that's, that is the point. You don't have to have all the answers. You just have to have the options and then get the answers. There is one other point I want to make. Um, even though an attorney drew up the contract with my husband, um, the buyer's agent has compensation coming to her in June if this goes through. So if you do use an attorney, um, they can still figure that out. I don't have any because it was my husband and I was being nice to him, but the, uh, buyer's agent does have a commission coming if this contract concludes in June. So that can because be put correct, in. Correct me if I'm wrong, Kim, in June, you're going to have to fill out a PSA and stuff, correct? No, no. Uh, the way that it's worded, he just has to have a lender, um, cause they had a purchase and sale contract and they have a lease agreement the lease agreement just lays out the terms um, and I'm not involved at all in this any further unless they renegotiate and change things. But um, no, there's no PSA. The, the uh, commission is already delineated in the contract. It's already laid out what happens, how it has to proceed. And then it, a title, it's all in there. So again, Kim only didn't take a commission because she's related. It, she shares money probably Correct. with her husband. You don't have to tell us everything, but I'm assuming. <laughs> so, but the point is, if you brought this to your seller as an option, you can still make it so you make a commission. And let's use this as a point to say something I say a lot, where always be very candid about how you get paid um, to your clients, whether it's a buyer or seller in a situation like this, because you don't want to get left out in the cold. So the, a big negative of this, option to you as a realtor, you don't get paid until the deal actually closes. Because right now it hasn't closed. This was six months ago or so for Kim. And if it closes in June, then Kim, well, Kim's not, but Kim would get paid if it was a standard client. So that's something to think about as a real estate agent and make sure you explain to your buyer, yes, we can look for real estate contracts and we can, we can do this and I can negotiate it. But um, when we talk to an attorney, we're going to have them write in that at the time that it closes, if it closes, I do get paid a commission for helping you find the property and show the property and negotiate the deal and get you in touch with the attorney and all these things, right? So make sure you're, whether it's a buyer or a seller, make sure you're reminding them, I only get paid via commission and that ha so that'll have to be put in somewhere, right? Um, all the more reason, talk to an attorney, make sure the attorney is aware of the situation and so on. Um, that's so. Um, that's pretty much it with uh, with a real estate contract. As you can see, it's really similar to um, to the other one. It's just delayed, um, and it's rent as opposed to a mortgage payment. And then, but they still refinance at a certain time, or in the real estate contract, they get financing at a certain time, and then the seller gets all their money. Okay, so it's just delaying um, the lump sum going to the seller. Um, okay, let's move on to the third one: assumptions. Um, assumptions is 
another one that's that's complicated that um, I haven't done. Um, so again, please get advice. Um, to call call Kim if you're ever uh, negotiating one of these. So um, and and then again, Kim Rachel, I'm going off my notes. Please speak up if you hear me say something that you think I'm wrong about because I'm I'm repeating what I learned last week. So the way an assumption works basically is I have a property that I bought two years ago for four hundred thousand, and I'm trying to sell it for four hundred fifty. Uh, so the closing costs are going to be about 8% on that, 4.50 times 0.8. Okay, whoops, nope, did that wrong. So that's, um, okay, so essentially you need a buyer who um, has a decent amount down because they got to pay the the seller's closing costs at a minimum, right, which is going to be about 8%, 8, 8 so a lot of buyers don't have 8% or more, so that's Again, it's not going to be feasible for a lot, but if you have a buyer who has eight plus percent available, what you can do is you can look for for listings that are um, that have assumable loans. So what I remember, Kim and Rachel, is all FHA, VA, and USDA can be assumed. They can't say no. Is that correct? Perfect. So that, I think that's correct. Not conventional, but some conventional. And that was the part that was the most confusing to me. They didn't explain how. Anyways, at this point, I don't understand what, why some conventional can be assumed and some can't. But um, we're going to put that to the side. So if somebody bought a home, again, two years ago for 400000 with a VA loan or an FHA loan or a USDA loan, they can list the property um, for four fifty dollars or whatever um, at, with an assumable loan. And so they could say, hey, you, you uh, write an offer for $450. I owe $390 on the home now. Um, so you need to come in with $60,000 down and then a takeover to loan of $390. That's essentially how it works. The benefit, interest rates two years ago were pretty freaking awesome. <laughs> like you could get a really good interest rate. You can also get, you can assume a VA loan even if you're not VA. Big asterisks with that, that's less attractive to a seller because while you have a VA loan, if you're a seller, if that loan is not closed out, so another buyer assumes a loan and it's not a VA buyer, then that loan affects, is still on their resume or their, it affects their eligibility until that loan is refinanced or paid off someday. So if that VA seller sold the home and I assume the loan, um, I would not, I would, that would be out of my VA eligibility, which I think is like 780,000 right now, give or take. So that's a negative, but FHA, there's no eligibility, USDA, et cetera. Um, so um, here's, I'm just going to read some of my, my notes here. Um, so this is um, like the first one, when the deal closes, it's closed, title changes, you, the seller, no longer own the property. The buyer owns the property. You're done as the seller. And the buyer just gets the loan. The seller gets has to pay their closing costs and gets whatever else comes from down payment. They walk away. They're good. They didn't make a lot of money probably, but they were able to probably sell it for more because they offered their loan as assumable at a 3% interest rate. That's the idea because I'll probably pay more for a home with 3% interest rate than I would for a home with 6% interest rate. Um, Assumable loans have to be owner-occupied, so you can't do this if you're an investor and buy it as an investment property. Um, again, I'm repeating everything going off my notes. If I'm wrong on any of this, it's because I wrote poor notes or I got false information. So we can kind of dig into this more. If, if, you, if someone's watching this at a later time and you have conflicting information, let's look into it. Um, anyone can assume a VA loan, but okay, I already talked about that. Um, this is a part that I wasn't aware of. FHA, VA, and USDA, it cannot be denied by the lender if the buyer qualifies. So if the buyer has the minimum credit score of you know, normally 620 or whatever it is, um, and they have the right debt to income and so on, if they qualify for it, the lender can't say, no, we don't want to, we don't want to do this. They have to say yes, which is I not- I have something to say about that. Please do. <laughs> um, they can make it difficult. Correct. So be prepared for that. They will never say it's not available, but they will make it sound like it is nearly impossible. I went through this when I assumed from Wells Fargo. Because if you think about it, why does Wells Fargo want to keep this loan that they're um, that they uh, 
are giving the three percent interest rate when somebody else could when they when you could refinance it with them at a six percent interest rate right they'd rather have the higher interest rate but the thing that i was not aware of before this meeting they can't say no only conventional can and that's the part that i'm not going to elaborate on because i they weren't super clear on that um so if you represent a seller and the seller is like okay how are you going to market my property this is a killer way to separate yourself from other brokers, right? You say, well, most brokers aren't going to tell you about this because it takes a lot of work on my part as a real estate agent. But um, with your permission, I'm going to call your lender and I'm going to get, um, I'm going to figure out what are the qualifications to make this loan assumable. So how can a buyer qualify for, for your loan? And then we can market as an assumable, market it, not market, market it as an assumable loan which most brokers aren't going to do for you. That's a freaking awesome thing to say in a listing appointment when you're interviewing against other agents. If you offer that and I come in for the appointment and I don't mention that, I mean, you're, you're definitely going to win that listing appointment. That's a huge deal. So um, what we talked about in the meeting was how do, how do you get that information from the lender? And that's the part that Kim's saying is going to be tough. So if you're, if you're representing the seller, um, work with the seller. I would ask the seller to... Um, uh, they can fill out paperwork with their lender that that says that they're allowed to disclose information about their loan to you. Because um, if you call and you say, hey, I want to talk about this loan, but you're not on the loan, they're not going to talk to you about it. Um, or the seller can get the information yourself. But ask them, like, what is, um, what is the um, minimum credit score, max debt to income, et cetera. So then when you market the property, you can have a, a supplement that says assumable loan criteria from the lender and have all the information laid out. Likely, most buyers are gonna write a standard offer, but again, you are doing your seller such a service by marketing it this way. So um, that's, again, I, I keep hitting hitting that. That's, that's really the point. Um, oh, if you're representing a buyer, a lot of sellers, again, listing brokers are often lazy. <laughs> Real estate agents are often lazy. They even, they don't even, or they don't know about this. They're just ignorant. And so a lot of times a home will be listed and um, and it won't say assumable, but it might be. So all you need to do is if you look up the property on Realist, you, you see a home that's listed, you see that it sold two years ago, look it up on Realist. And on Realist, it will tell you at the bottom of the Realist page how they bought the home. FHA, VA, conventional. They'll, they'll, it says that on Realist. And if it's FHA or VA, Go to the listing broker and say, hey, I know you don't have this as an assumable loan, but are you aware that it probably is? And they'll be like, uh, what? And then you can kind of coach the listing broker through and then try and get that for your buyer. So that's another way you can kind of work this in your favor. And you can tell your clients, I'm going to be actively looking for assumable loans for you. That's huge. Um, but you might have to do more legwork if, if it's a, a listing broker who is, I'm not being rude when I say ignorant. I mean, literally ignorant. They're, they're not aware of, of this. Um, they said these closings can take a while, about 60 days. So something to be aware of. If you have a buyer, just let your buyer know that this is going to be a longer process. If you have a seller say, hey, this would be a longer process. Um, uh, there's generally an assumption fee. It's about $1,000. Um, benefits though, there's no appraisal. So that evens out. This, uh, an appraisal is about $1,000 as well. So it's kind of a wash. Um, and there's no other financing fees that doesn't sound right, but that's what they said. So again, we're learning here. This is new for everybody. There might be more, but what they said is a thousand dollar fee. So your closing costs are going to be dramatically less as a buyer, um, because normally a buyer pays two to three percent in closing costs. You're going to be talking about title, escrow fee, no appraisal, and a one thousand dollar assumption fee. That's that. That's huge. pretty accurate. That's about what I paid. That's huge. That sounds crazy to me that there's no other fees, but that's awesome. Um. I have some notes here about what, what a buyer is going to need to assume the loan. And it's all the things that buyers already provided their lender, right? You're going to need your past two years tax returns, two months of bank statements, past 30 days of pay stubs. But that's normal. A buyer who's already pre-approved probably already has that. One negative that I didn't write in my notes, but um, occurred to me after the fact is um, if you're working with a lender, kind of sucks for a lender. <laughs> so, you know, whatever. They win some, they lose some, but you know, you might have to have a hard conversation. Hey, thanks for working with my buyer and writing 75 offers with me, but we actually found a home and 
we can't use you. But that's just that's just is what it is. And and any good lender is gonna be like, well, good for the buyer. That sucks, but good for the buyer. So that's all I have to say about assumable loans. Um, anything you want to add to that, Kim or Rachel? Not really. You seem to have covered pretty much all of it. Um, can't think of anything to, to add at this point other than, you know, you can think about potentially if you have sellers who, you know, need to sell, you could combine assuming with seller contract. Yeah, that, okay, thank you. That, no, that is a very important thing. Um, so what she's saying is, so if somebody owes 300, they want to sell it for 400, you need to come in with at least, again, the 8% to pay your clo the seller's closing costs because likely a seller is not going to want to sell a home and have to pay money at closing. So you still need the 8%, but then that extra 10%, um, that's the difference between the loan amount and the, uh, in the, the down payment. If your buyer only has you know 10%, but there's still 10% left, um, you could do a contract on top of that where you say, you're essentially saying to the seller, will you give me a loan for $50,000? I've got 50,000 down. Um, the homes, I, I got, I'm going to assume your $300,000 loan, an extra 50,000, can you give me a loan for it? So now I'm paying my, my uh, I'm, I'm taking over your loan and then I'm paying you a $50,000, you know, on a $50,000 payment plan. You can amortize it however you want. Anyways, it's all, all totally negotiable, but that's a way to um, to come up with that, to, to come up with a solution. So that that becomes again less attractive to the seller because now it's like at closing, they're literally making nothing. But sometimes a seller just wants to get out of the home, right? They can't afford their payment anymore. They're just ready to be done. They just need to get out of it. So that um, thanks for saying that. I totally forgot about that. I mean, there is the option of pulling a second, but um, that becomes really, really costly. Yeah. There, there's options, I think, is the biggest takeaway from this. I'm reading my notes on the, on a, on the last one. So give me just a second. Okay. Yeah. So wrap of all the four that we talked about was the most, um, the one I was least knowledgeable about. So a wrap is like the second one we talked about. The deal, and, and again, Kim, please speak up if you hear me say something incorrect. The deal doesn't close. So essentially I say, uh, Christy, I'm gonna buy your home in two years. In the meantime, I'm gonna rent your home for the price for whatever the, uh, uh, your um, uh, mortgage payment is, right? So you, you're paying $2,200 a month. I'm gonna rent your home for $2,200 a month. And that money is gonna go into an escrow account that then pays your, your mortgage and your taxes and all that. So everyone breaks even for a year or two years or whatever you wanna negotiate. And then after a year, I'm going to um, get financing. So this is attractive to a seller who, again, this is a seller who does not have a lot of equity. They just want to be done with this home. They just want to get out from under it. Um, but there's no closing costs, except for whatever the attorney is going to cost, right, to, to draft this, this documentation, um, because the home doesn't actually close. And then the buyer just lives in the home. They rent the home, rent, right? And then after a year or after two years, then the buyer can get financing because the buyer's credit's a little low right now, and they need to build their credit first. This one seems really risky to a seller. So does, so does the second one we talked about. Um, you want to make sure the buyer is putting enough down, right? They're putting like a, enough of a deposit down so that if the seller, if the buyer then can't refinance at the end of the term in a year, the seller has enough money to, uh, or the seller, you know, has enough money in, that they that they got from the uh, wrap that, you know, covers their losses at that time. Maybe the market goes down. Maybe they have to now evict the buyer because he's a tenant in their home. I don't love this for I, I this of all the options I did not love. I don't I don't like this for sellers at all. It just seems really risky. The seller is putting a tenant in the home likely because the tenant has really bad credit or bad income. So it's probably not the best tenant. Um in the hopes that the tenant's going to improve their financial situation next year and then buy the home for what they agreed to. And if the market crashes, 
you can bet your butt that the tenants can be like, peace, I'm out. I'm going to move out or peace, I'm in. So you have to evict me and I'm not buying the home. Sounds really risky to, to a seller to me. I, I, I'm not even sure. I might mention it to a seller, but I would probably advise them not to do it. For a buyer, if a seller is off, offering a wrap as a way to purchase a home, and you do have a buyer who's in a <clears throat> financial situation where they can't necessarily qualify for a loan today, but they might be able to in a year, it makes sense, right? But just a little, just a little more complicated. Um, Kim, would you agree that I explained that somewhat properly? Okay, so um, <laughs> those are kind of the those are those are four options. And now for the last part of the meeting, I just kind of want to discuss like again, how can we include this in our pre-listing packets and in our buyer presentations as options to a buyer um, and options to your seller. Um, there's a quote that I heard from Ben Kenny, who's like one of the top producing real estate brokers in the world. Um, he said, in the absence of value, price becomes everything. And I really like that quote because you flip it around and you say, how, how do I provide such value to my clients that they don't question the price? Because right now, people are penny pinching, right? Everyone's trying to save pennies and dollars. And so Redfin is going to become even more of a, of a threat to you as a two and a half or 3% listing broker, right? Or you as a two and a half, 3% buyer's broker, who's not going to credit them 15, 1.5% at closing, right? So when you are able to come into a present, a listing presentation and provide this value and show them how you can save them thousands of dollars, they're probably much less likely to try and nickel and dime you on your commission. And that's really the point. The point is to, well, there's three points. You want to service your client. We have a fiduciary duty to do what's in their best interest. And we don't know what's in their best interest, but we got to give them the information so they can make a decision on what's in their best interest. Number two, get the listing, get the buyer, beat your competition by being more valuable to them. And number three, protect your commission. Make sure you're making that full two and a half to 3%. And I feel like when you come to a presentation with this information, you're going to have a much better shot. I, I mean, a much better shot. If I'm an ignorant seller who was not aware of these and I'm interviewing two people and only one of them told me about these, I would absolutely pay more. Absolutely. You told me, I mean, you just told me how I can market my home way better than this other person who's going to charge less, but that likely means I'll sell it for more, right? So that was kind of the main takeaway. Also, Shauna Tryon had a really great point on um, for, for sale by owners or cancel on expired listings. Everyone's calling for sale by owners and cancel on expired listings. How many of them are saying, hey, you want to know why your home is not selling? Like, it might be a little overpriced, but there's another reason why. Your listing broker, previous listing broker, didn't market your home right. Do you know that you have an assumable loan? You can look this up. Look at canceled listings. Go through, click on real estate. See, they bought it FHA. You can tell them, do you know that your loan is assumable? You can market it so that somebody else can take over your loan. Okay, I'm listing, right? I'm a list. I, I'm a seller who I just fired my agent. And I'm getting 10 calls a day, but you're the only one telling me that it didn't sell because it's not assumable. That's huge. I thought that was brilliant by Shauna. Shauna, if you're watching this, nice. I thought that was brilliant. Like this is such a great way to talk to, to sellers who are already waving their hands saying, we do want to sell, but nobody can sell our home. I can sell your home because I'm going to market it different from any other real estate agent, assuming that they didn't do it properly. But um, yeah, that's about all I got, guys. Anything, uh, Chrissy, Kim, anything you guys want to add? Well, I hope that was helpful. Again, I know I'm I, I'm I'm fairly ignorant on a lot of this. I, I've done a, quite a few real estate contracts. The first home I ever bought, actually, we bought with owner financing. We sold a property two years ago that we owner finance to the person who bought the property. So I am, I'm very familiar with those. Um, Kim's obviously a designated broker. So legal questions go to her first, but if you, if you want just help kind of going through the form, I'm always available to talk about these things. And then the other things, the real estate contracts, the assumptions, the wraps, let's work through it together. You know, if you have a question about it, I may not have the answer, but let's find the answers together. Cause I want, I want to add these tools to my tool belt too. So if you ask a question that I don't have an answer to, or you ask him a question, then we're going to get better 
iron sharpens iron. So let's work together and try and, um, you know, try and figure out the best way to, to, uh, to utilize these. And um, also to anybody watching this at a later point, if you know answers to something or, or you know that I said something incorrect, um, will you let us know? Um, email me or just call me uh, or Kim and say, hey, just so you know, this is something that you should mention um, because again, we're, we all benefit from, from each other and our, and our shared knowledge. We're a great symbiotic brokerage that helps each other out. So if you can help out your fellow brokers, if you know something else that I didn't say, that'd be great. Rachel, I think this would be really cool if um, I could maybe sit down with you if we like um, added a um, a page that people uh, added a page that people um, could add to their listing presentations and their buyer presentations that um, says you know something like um, you know creative financing ways to market your home or creative financing ways to purchase a home um, and then you can pull that out of your listing presentation and say let's talk about these. Um, I think that'd be really cool. I know that's going to be a lot of work. I know you're going out of town next week. So maybe when you get back um, from Mexico, we can do that. Yeah, I think that's smart, especially since we're talking about how this is going to like affect like your buying and listing presentations. I think adding it to both package, just like other options that you can do and like we can present would be smart. Rad. All right, guys, this is a great meeting. Thank you, everyone. And um, yeah, let's kill it. On our way to kill it. All right, have a good day. All right, guys, see ya. Bye.